Let's see if I can one take this. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Welcome to the Too Old, Too New Music Discovery Podcast, the podcast that every week brings you something old, something new, something Nate, something Bruce. The premise is simple. Each week we bring you two songs apiece, one new song that's been spinning on our metaphorical turntable platter, and one old song that we believe still absolutely matters. I'm Nate Runkle, host of the Yo That's My John podcast, and with me, as always, is my good friend Bruce Warren from WXPN. Bruce, how are we doing this week? Uh, what up? Everything's good, man. I'm exhausted, though. I got to tell you, honestly, I'm exhausted. You know why I'm exhausted, Nate? I think I have an idea. Because I have spent endless hours listening to this new Taylor Swift record. H like, how about you? Uh, very much so, which is why I am very excited to let the listeners know that for one week, we are going to enter the Tortured Poets Department full time and we're going to bring you two new and two old taylor swift songs because that's what the discourse wants all right the algorithm asks for it and we will provide <laughs> it sure does it sure does I i'm telling you it's it's uh that's all i've been listening to pretty much for the last week so um I guess without further ado, why don't you go first? And do you okay. want to hit? You want to hit something new first? I guess. Let's do. Let's do something new. It's fresh. It's, yeah, it's, it's fresh. It's, it's on exactly. our minds. Uh, so uh, for my new um, from the tortured uh, poets department uh, uh, anthology from the, from the large one, um, which is uh, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Taylor released the tortured poets department, and then two hours later said, "Just kidding. Here's a whole shitload of more songs." Um, and uh, that version is the anthology. And from that, uh, my pick, uh, my first pick for something new is So High School uh, by Taylor Swift. So let's hear a little bit of that. And right now. All right. So that's So High School. And uh, here's the thing about me. And it's something that I've realized in the past few years. And that is um, I have an addiction to the sound of 90s guitars, especially if there's a female vocalist on top of it. And to me, no high school could fit in um, with any of the kind of resurgent tracks. You know, your your last dinner party, your bully, your blonde shell. It's got that kind of guitar-y vibe from the 90s that I absolutely adore. Um, this track, produced by uh, Aaron Dessner, uh, the, he and Jack Antonoff kind of split production duties. Aaron's tracks are mostly on the anthology back half um, but this song just absolutely screams to me and I love everything about it from that. And not just musically, like the, the lyrics are as titled. So high school, like it just kind of evokes that kind of sensibility. Yeah, it totally, it totally does. You know, it's really interesting. I actually had, you know, to sh to, to give you an example of how much Taylor Swift, like almost immediately impacts the you know, the zeitgeist of, you know, the youth of today. Somebody said to me the other day, I was at work and I made a comment and they said to me, that is so high school. <laughs> and I just cracked up. Like I knew exactly what they were talking about. So, you know, instantly this song is, you know, working its way into the vernacular. But here's a question for you. Um, I think Taylor drops, uh, I think, American Pie. There's a lot of brand placement in the on this record, yes. you know. So on this particular song, American Pie, and I think she also um, mentions Grand Theft Auto. Um, how many uh, Taylor Swift fans do you think have actually seen American Pie? Do you think American Pie's numbers like, you know, like spiked up on whatever video services there are out there today? One thousand percent. And beyond that, I, I and, and, and this is somewhat anecdotally, I'd like to see the numbers, but um, Dead Poets Society I can't tell you how many uh, posts I've seen of people saying, I've never seen Dead Poet Society, but based off of this, I'm going to go watch it. So, yeah, I, I'm sure there's uh, the downloads of Grand Theft Auto, uh, of Charlie Puth, of uh, American Pie, the starting line, our local our local emo faves, the starting line. There's That's right. so many references on this album, and I can't, I got to think every single one of them woke up Friday morning and was like, well, what, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what do you so, got for something new? Or, well, it's you... a, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to we'll go into something new here for sure. You know, um, talking about all the, you know, the the people and things and movies, et cetera, 
uh, the you know pop culture. I am not talking. I am not talking today. I am not work. My mouth is fucking not working. Um, of all the of the many pop cultural refer of the many pop cultural of the many pop culture references um, that you just mentioned, I'm thinking a song for um, the mentioning of an amazing band from Scotland uh, called the Blue Nile, and if Taylor would not have put the mention of either the band or the song Downtown Lights, the band is the Blue Nile and the song is Downtown Lights. If she had not put that in the, you know, narrative of the song Guilty of Sin, I probably would not have picked this song. But I'm telling you, as soon as like those are the opening lyrics, right? She, she sings Drowning in the Blue Nile. He sent me Downtown Lights. I was like immediately because I love that record. I love that band. Um, I was immediately like brought into her world on this song. So we're going to roll with this new one, Guilty of Sin from Taylor's new record. It's awesome. Guilty of Sin uh, from Taylor's new album. And I have to tell you, I think this is like Taylor Swift mid-tempo perfection. This song, it just touch, it just hits all the sweet spots of why Taylor Smith is so amazing. She is a is a like a, a pop perfectionist like and her her talent and skill at crafting um the melody line of a chorus that'll just hook you whether you've heard the song or not it sounds it sounds like an old friend um and this song is exactly uh an example of that. Um, it's so perfect, um, you know, uh, working on this. So I, I listen to music mostly in my car, um, sometimes at my desk um, at work. Um, but working on this, putting this episode together, I listened to a bunch of these songs on my headphones for the first time. And the, the, the production on this, it's easy to overlook. Um, but it's it to me, I think this album might be a headphone masterpiece and Guilty of Sin is definitely one of those songs that feels so much better in your headphones. Yeah, it doesn't work too hard from the production perspective. I agree with you, Nate. It doesn't work too hard to be what it is. And I think that's sort of the brilliance of like, you know, working with Jack Antonoff, working with Desner. You know, these guys are these guys have made unbelievable records, you know, over the last decade plus. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's elements of the album, like the the two songs that you that that we play today, um, so high school and guilty of sin. I think they sort of are good representations of like two you know two sides of the Taylor Swift musical experience. Um, now, uh, I don't think that, I can't remember, and this is a problem right now with the record because it's too freaking long. Um, like. Are there dan are there dancey tracks on the record? I can't remember. Not really. And you know, um, speaking to the length, it, that's one of the things I've really been challenged with um, with this release. Is how do you how do you judge this? Do you measure the sixteen songs that were released that are on the vinyl, right? That are on the initial project that came out, or do you look at the anthology as a whole piece? I saw someone uh, recently refer to it as if it, th we already got Taylor's version with the vaulted song. And these are the vaulted songs. And it made it make kind of more sense to me that like her fans want this, whereas it's a bit it, like you said, it's really exhausting to have to go through 31 tracks, two hours and and also have a life. <laughs> no offense to anybody who, you know, <laughs> eats who, this up. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, my first sitting with it, um, I had a similar I did a similar thing with the Taylor record that I did with the Beyonce record when it came out. Like I woke up super early before I had to go to work and I literally just sat with the uh, album in in the foreground um, while it played. But I actually stopped at this at track 16 because I wanted to your last point, like I wanted it. I wanted to hear the album, yeah. the album as opposed to the anthology. Um, and also by track 16, it was time to go to work. You know what I mean? So <laughs> so um, but I have subsequently spent more time with the anthology pieces of it than the first, you know, the proper, if you will, the proper album. Um, Cause I still don't remember if there was a dancey song on the record. Yeah. Well, so, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because like I said, the anthology stuff is mostly the Desner stuff. And, and one, one of the things that like, I, I feel bad for saying this because I love him so much, but I feel like the Jack Antonoff, Taylor Swift um, partnership needs to take a timeout. 
because there's a bit of sameness that's kind of blurring, you know, that kind of came at the end of um, the uh, folklore uh, era and into Midnight's and now this. And, you know, she says this is kind of the end of a chapter and the start of something new. And I and I kind of hope so. Um, but this definitely feels like it was for the fans. Like it was. Yeah, um, it was definitely for the fans. Um, you raised a really good point about the the sameness of it. Um, which was a point addressed really nicely by one of the uh, one of the two things critical reviews of this record that I actually read, um, and I'm referring to specifically here uh, the Pitchfork review, which um, bragging rights I have to say uh, was written by a person named Olivia Horn, and when Olivia was a University of Penn undergrad. They were an intern of, of mine here at the radio station, so I'm very proud of Olivia. Um, Olivia's review was spot on, I thought. And then the other review that I read, um, the genius Ann Powers, um, their NPR review, um, sort of gave us a different look into the new album. So like, you know, um, have you read anything that, that sort of caught your attention that you want to suggest people should check out? Um, I, I, so one of the things I was telling Bruce before this started, one of the things I've been reading a lot of is not critical review, but more, um, fan review. And, um, there's a, a, a gentleman who is a documentary filmmaker, uh, named Malcolm Ingram. Okay. And, uh, he directed a film called uh, small town gay bar, which is, um, a brilliant documentary about a small town gay bar. Um, uh, but he, um, is an enormous Taylor Swift fan. And he kind of rejected this album as much as he likes it musically because he says it's it's lyrically mean um, that he feels that it's kind of um, punching at people who can't punch back Boom. Um, uh, because of a lot of the relationship stuff, which I respect him saying. But I can't think of any other artist who has ever taken to task for writing a negative song about their ex. I mean, we champion um, Stevie Nicks for singing Silver Springs right in Lindsey Buckingham's face because it was fucking awesome, right? Yeah, but, but, exactly. But for some reason, uh, Taylor Swift kind of does not get kind of gifted that kind of benefit to be able to have heartbreak. And I feel like one of the issues with her kind of revisiting this, and it's part of the sameness, is the fact that as a billionaire... There's very little that resonates with humans anymore for her, right? Except for love and heartbreak. So the fact that she's trafficking in this, it to me, is her still trying to write music that res resonates with regular people, uh, which I admire. Like, I, I mean, like, it's it's her one piece of connection that still exists. Yeah, very insightful, Nate. That, see, this is why we talk about music. <laughs> you're you're just you're a fucking smart guy, dude. I try. I, I love that. I love that. Um. Okay, so wait, I wanted to say one more thing yeah. which uh, that I did read, and actually I read it this morning. So there's a great band from Philadelphia called the Tisburys, and the lead singer, Tyler, is very good on, on X, formerly Twitter. Um, and I loved, uh, 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 I loved his tweet this morning. It said, Taylor is in her human touch lucky town era. <laughs> and I immediately got it because being like the world's biggest Bruce Springsteen <laughs> fan, let me tell you, I, I was that was like he trusted his fans when he released those two records, and I was there for every, almost all every song that was on those two records. That's unbelievable. So, that's a great line, right? It's an, totally an amazing line. Great line. I'll tell you what, um, and and it, it kind of doesn't work on the timeline, but uh, when Taylor Swift is ready to do her Nebraska, uh, sign me up because that's really what I want from her. You know, uh, post the tiny desk performance that she did. I really just want her and an acoustic guitar, and I want I want that album. Maybe a piano. I'll take a piano. But but um, she's an incredible songwriter, and I think sometimes it gets it gets uh, lost in the sauce. Bring on Taylor Swift's Nebraska. Uh, that is right. That is that is that is a a super like whoa. I can't even imagine that. That would be pretty awesome, actually. And I think she wow. could do it. I think she could pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me something old of hers. All right. Something old. So I picked this song. 1989 is, in my opinion, the best Taylor Swift album. Okay. Um, New Romantics on that record is a freaking banger. And it's like, when I first listened to the record, that was the song that jumped out immediately and grabbed me. And to this very day, it still grabs me. So let's check it out. New Romantics. It's T Swift from '89. Heartbreak is the personal anthem. Oh my Love god, that. it's it, so good! It's such it's such a great song. Do you know? Um, it, 
every time I hear this song, it kind of reminds me of uh, Foster the People's Helena Beat. Yes, you know I do know that. <laughs> Check it out. Check it out. You can feel the energy. You can feel the energy. Anyway, new great, great song. And what do you got? Something old. Uh, so my something old is actually not available, so it's not going to show up on our Spotify playlist. So I'm going to re- okay. I'm going to replace it um, with uh, her song from the Hannah Montana soundtrack because uh, uh, I, I, because that's just who I am. All right. Uh, but uh, my old is actually uh, from uh, the CMT Awards, and it's a thing that she did as a spoof uh, with T Pain, and it's called Thug Story. And uh, I'm just going to play it, and then we'll kind of get into it. Yeah. So that's Thug's story, all right? Now, the <laughs> the story behind this is um, she's actually kind of distanced herself from this. Um, T-Pain has distanced himself from it because they both feel like they were um, taking something out of the culture that they shouldn't have, right? Um, and 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 look, I am not I am not the the culture police, and I'm not anything. All I know is when this happened, this is what made me a Taylor Swift fan in the beginning, okay? And it's because one of the things I love about Taylor Swift is she is a goddamn goofball, all right? And she just owns it. And it's it's one of my favorite things about her. I don't know if you remember the Apple Music ads that she did. Um, there's one where it's her um, rocking out to Jimmy Eat World's The Middle. And there's another no. where um, she's listening to, I think it's like Drake and Future. And she's on a treadmill and she ends up falling and busting her face open and stuff like that, but then gets back up and starts rapping again. Um, the fact that she has the ability to kind of mock herself and doesn't take herself seriously. That was the first thing that kind of hooked me. And so Thug Story uh, just fills me with joy because it's just so funny to, especially if you see the video, which I'll link in the notes, you'll be able to click it and watch the video. Um, it, it cracks me up. It's great that you chose that. You know, it's it was sort of, it reminded me of like the song parodies from SNL. Yes. Um, or like, or the Lonely Island, like you know, it 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 that was good. I know I didn't know I didn't know about this. This is that's pretty cool that you chose this actually. The um the there's a the cadence of her rapping. It's funny you mentioned the Lonely Island. Totally reminds me of Natalie Portman's uh, Natalie's rap. Um, oh yeah, right. <laughs> for, with the no questions, um, right. which is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, so that's 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 our, our our Taylor Swift discourse for you. I hope uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, uh, I say, would do, do you suggest? I mean, like you uh, dig the album. Would you suggest uh, people listen to it, check it out if they're uh, into that sort of thing? Heck yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, like you know, like I said, I've heard people say that it's just for the fans or something like that. But um, I I think the the core piece of it. Um, is great and there's so many songs that we didn't that we didn't even talk about um, I had Down Bad on here which is another favorite of mine the uh, Tortured Poets Department which is the the title track of the song, album um, th- like there's there's not a ba- there's not bad songs on this it, but the, you know as much as you might hear sameness and you might even find sameness um, that one thing that you hear is pretty good <laughs> yeah that that's that, well that's the point I mean that's exactly right you know um like I'm a super fan of a bunch of bands, right? And there are times when I just go, okay, I'm oversaturated, right? Um, but I am going to attempt at some point. So a few years ago, um, Charlie Hall, who was the who was the drummer of the War on Drugs, does this really cool thing on his Spotify. Um, he takes really long albums and boils them down to like one single great record. And he calls this feature that he does addition, E-D-I-T-I-O-N, by subtraction, okay? So um, I tried it, the last Drake, I'm a huge Drake fan, as you probably know. Uh, I did it with the last Drake uh, album. I think there were 20 plus songs and I boiled it down to what are the 10 or 11 best songs on the Drake album. I'm going to attempt, now that I've spent a, a fair amount of time at the new Taylor record, I'm going to attempt to come up with my own sort of hypothetical, you know, 12 song. This would make for the most epic. It would be, you know, 11.0 if Pitchfork were reviewing this record. Let's just put it that way, right? So anyway, I'm going to attempt to do that. And if I get there in the next week or two, we'll we'll make sure everybody knows about Definitely. it. Definitely. I'll also uh, challenge you to do that with Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 because I find it to be impossible. 
A great example. <laughs> Perfect. Great example. Yeah, exactly. Well, guys, thank you for joining us again. If you want to find anything out about us, you can, uh, you know, like and subscribe to this podcast. You can follow us on the socials. I'm at Yo, That's My John on all of them. Bruce is at Some Velvet Blog on all of them. And you can catch Bruce's radio show from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. See, I remembered this time. Every Saturday, you can catch me on Why Not Radio uh, from 5 to 8 every Monday. And, of course, you can listen to the Yo, That's My John podcast wherever you get podcasts from bruce thanks as always for doing this and uh i can't wait to talk some more music in the future all right hey good hanging see ya